class, uh, we're going to read chapter 2, uh, so this is on page 15 of, um, of your books. Dill left us early in September to return to Meridian. We saw him off on the 5 o'clock bus, and I was miserable without him, until it occurred to me that I would be starting school in a week. I never looked forward more to anything in my life. Hours of winter time had found me in the treehouse, looking out over the schoolyard, spying on multiple multitudes of children through a two-power telescope Jim had given me, learning their games, following Jim's red jacket through the wriggling circles of Blind Man's Bluff, secretly sharing their misfortunes and minor victories. I longed to join them. Jim condescended to take me to school on the first day, a job usually done by one's parents, but... Atticus had said Jim would be delighted to show me where my room was. I think some money changed hands in this transaction, for as we trotted, trotted around the corner past the Radley place, I heard an unfamiliar jingle in Jim's pockets. When we slowed to a walk at the edge of the schoolyard, Jim was careful to explain during school hours I was not to bother him. I was not to approach him with requests to enact a chapter of Tarzan and the Ant-Men, to embarrass him with references to his private life, or tag along with him at recess at noon. I was to stick with the first grade, and he would stick with the fifth. In short, I was to leave him alone. You mean we can't play anymore? I asked. We'll do like we always do at home, he said, but you'll see. School's different. It certainly was. Before the first morning was over, Miss Caroline Fisher, our teacher, hauled me up in front of the room and patted the palm of my hand with her ruler. Then she made me stand in the corner until noon. Miss Caroline was no more than 21. She had bright auburn hair and pink cheeks and wore crimson fingernail polish. She also wore high-heeled pumps and red and white striped dress. She looked and smelled like a peppermint drop. She boarded across the street, boarded means like rent a room, okay? She boarded across the street, one door down from us, in Miss Maud, Maudie Atkinson's upstairs front room. And when Miss Maudie introduced us to her, Jim was in a haze for days. Jim, Jim uh, thought Miss Caroline was pretty hot. Miss Caroline printed her name on the blackboard and said, This says I am Miss Caroline Fisher. I am from North Alabama, from Winston County. The class murmured apprehensively. Should she prove to harbor her share of the peculiarities indigenous to that region? When Alabama succeeded from the Union on January 11, 1861, Winston County succeeded from Alabama. Every child knew Macomb County knew it. North Alabama was full of liquor interests, big mules, steel companies, Republicans, professors, and other persons of no background. Miss Carolina began the day by reading us a story about cats. The cats had long conversations with each one another. They wore cunning little clothes and lived in a warm house beneath a kitchen stove. By the time Miss Cat called the drugstore for an order of chocolate malted mice, the class was wriggling like a bucket full of catawa worms. Miss Caroline seemed unaware that the ragged, denim-shirted, flower-sack-skirted first grade, most of whom had chopped cotton fed hogs from the time they were able to walk, were immune to imaginative literature. Miss Caroline came to the end of the story and said, Oh, wasn't that nice? Then she went to the blackboard and printed the alphabet in enormous square letters, turned to the class and asked, Does anybody know what these are? Everybody did. Most of the first grade had failed it last year. I suppose she chose me because she knew my name. As I read the alphabet, a faint line appeared between her eyebrows, and after making me read most of my first grade, my first reader and the stock market quotations from the mobile register out loud, she discovered I was literate and looked at me with more than faint distaste. Miss Caroline told me to tell my father not to teach me anymore. It would interfere with my reading. Teach me, I said, surprised. He hasn't taught me anything, Miss Caroline. Atticus ain't got time to teach me anything. I added, when Miss Caroline smiled and shook her head. Why, he's so tired at night, he just sits in the living room and reads. Well, if he didn't teach you, who did? Miss Caroline asked good-naturedly. Somebody did. You weren't born reading the mobile register. Jim says I was. He read in a book 
where I was a bullfinch instead of a finch. Jim says my name's really Jean Louise Bullfinch, that I got swapped when I was born. I'm really a... Miss Caroline apparently thought I was lying. Let's not let our imaginations run away with us, dear, she said. Now tell your father not to teach you anymore. It's best to begin reading with a fresh mind. You tell him I'll take over from here and try to undo the damage. Ma'am, your father does not know how to teach. You can have a seat now. Why do you think um, Miss Caroline would be upset about this, that one of her kids already knows how to read? Because she doesn't have, now she's like, she doesn't have a job, she doesn't have anything for this little girl to do, so she wants to use the time to, like, have her be with, like, at the same level as the rest of the class. So she's upset. Bottom of page 17. I mumbled that I was sorry. I'm retired, meditating upon my crime. I never deliberately learned how to read, but somehow I had been wallowing illicitly in daily papers. In the long hours of church, was it then that I learned? I could not remember not being able to read hymns. Now that I was compelled to think about it, reading was something that had just came to me, as learning to fasten my seatbelt, fasten the seat of my union suit without looking around and achieving two bows from a snarl of shoelaces. I could not remember when the lines above Atticus's moving fingers separated into words, but I had stared at them all the evenings in my memory, listening to the news of the day, bills to be enacted in the laws, the diary of Lorenza Dow, anything Atticus happened to be reading when I crawled into his lap every night, until I feared I would lose it. I never loved to read. One does not love breathing. That's actually may sound strange to you, but... Um, like that happens, like uh, people learn, some people learn how to read sp spontaneously. They just, it just happens. They just are around it so much and it just comes naturally to them. So um, that's what happened to Scout. I knew I had annoyed, top page 18. I knew I had annoyed Miss Caroline, so I let well enough alone and stared out the window until recess when Jim cut me from the covey of first graders in the schoolyard. He asked me how I was getting along, and I told him. If I didn't have to stay, I'd leave, Jim. That damn lady says Atticus has been teaching me to read and for him to stop it. Don't worry, Scout, Jim comforted me. Our teacher says Miss Caroline's introducing a new way of teaching. She learned about it in college. It'll be all in all the grades soon. You don't have to learn much out of the books that way. It's like... If you want to learn about cows, you got to go milk one, see? Yeah, Jim, but I don't want to study cows. I Sure you do. You have to know about cows. They're a big part of life in Macon County. I consented, contented myself with asking Jim if he'd lost his mind. I'm just trying to tell you the new way they're teaching first grade, stubborn. It's the Dewey Decimal System. Having never questioned Jim's pronouncements, I saw no reason to begin now. The Dewey Decimal System consisted, in part, of Miss Caroline waving cards at us on which were printed the cat, rat, man, and you. No comment seemed to be expected out of us, and the class received these impressionistic revelations in silence. I was bored, so I began a letter to Dill. Miss Caroline kept me, caught me writing and told me to tell my father to stop teaching me. Besides, she said, we don't write in the first grade, we print. You won't learn to write until you're in the third grade. Calparino was to blame for this. It kept me from driving her crazy on rainy days, I guess. She would set me a writing task by scrawling the alphabet firmly across the top of a tablet and then copying out a chap chapter of the Bible beneath. If I reproduced her penmanship satisfactorily, she rewarded me with an open-faced sandwich of bread and butter and sugar. In Calparino's teaching, there was no sentimentality. I seldom pleased her, and she seldom rewarded me. Everyone who goes home to lunch, hold up your hand, said Miss Caroline, breaking into my new grudge against Calparino. The town children did so, and she looked us over. Everybody who brings his lunch, put it on top of his desk. Molasses buckets appeared from nowhere. The ceiling danced with metallic light. 
Miss Caroline walked up and down the rows, peering and poking into lunch containers, nodding at the contents pleased her, frowning a little at others. She stopped at Walter Cunningham's desk. Where's yours, she asked. Walter Cunningham's face told everybody in the first grade he had hookworms. His absence of shoes told us how he got them. People caught hookworms going barefoot in barnyards and hog wallows. If Walter had owned any shoes, he would have worn them the first day of school and then discarded them until midwinter. He did have on a clean shirt and neatly mended coveralls. Did you forget your lunch this morning? asked Miss Caroline. Walter looked straight ahead. I saw a muscle jump in his skinny jaw. Did you forget it this morning? asked Miss Caroline. Walter's jaw twitched again. Yes, um, he finally mumbled. Miss Caroline went to her desk and opened her purse. Here's a quarter, she said to Walter. Go and eat in downtown today, and you can pay me back tomorrow. Walter shook his head. No, thank you, ma'am, he drawled softly. Impatience crept into Miss Caroline's voice. Here, Walter, come get it. Walter shook his head again. When Walter shook his head a third time, someone whispered, Go on, tell her, Scout. I turned around and saw that most of the town people and the entire bus delegation looking at me. Miss Caroline and I had conferred twice already. They were looking at me in innocent assurance that familiarity breeds understanding. I rose graciously on Walter's behalf. Uh, Miss Caroline, what is it, Jean Louise? Now, Jean Louise is Scout's real name, okay? That's uh, the teacher's not going to call her Scout. She's going to call her by her real name. Miss Caroline, he's a Cunningham. I sat back then. What, Jean Louise? I thought I had made things sufficiently clear. It was clear enough to the rest of us. Walter Cunningham was sitting there lying with his, lying his head off. He didn't forget his lunch. He didn't have any. He had none today nor would have any tomorrow or any the next day. He probably never seen three quarters together at the same time in his entire life. I tried again. Walter's one of the Cunninghams, Miss Caroline. I beg your pardon, Jean Louise. That's okay, ma'am. You'll get to know all the country folk after a while. The Cunninghams never took anything they can't pay back. No church baskets, no script stamps. So it was like an early form of like, government help. They never took anything off anybody. They get along on what they have. They don't have much, but they get along on it. My special knowledge of the Cunningham tribe, one branch that is, was gained from events of last winter. Walter's father had been one of Atticus's clans. After a dreary conversation in our living room one night about his entailment, before Mr. Cunningham left, he said, Mr. Finch, I don't know when I'll be able to ever repay you. Now, pause right there. Walter's father goes and gets legal help from Atticus, and he has no way to pay. Okay? Let that, so he says, I don't know how I'm going to be able to pay you. So here's Atticus's response. Let that be the least of your worries, Walter, Atticus said. When I asked Jim what entailment was, and Jim described it as a condition of having a tail in a crack, I asked Atticus if Mr. Cunningham would ever pay us. Not money, Atticus said, but before the year's out, all have been paid. You watch. We watched. One morning, Jim and I found a load of stove wood in our backyard. Later, a sack of hickory nuts appeared on the back step. With Christmas came a crate of smellax and holly. That spring, when we found a crocker sack full of turnip greens, Atticus said Cunningham had more than paid him. Why does he pay you like that? Because that's the only way he can pay me. He has no money. Are we poor, Atticus? Atticus nodded. We are indeed. Jim's nose wrinkled. Are we as poor as the Cunninghams? Not exactly. Cunninghams are country folks, farmers, and the crash hit them the hardest. Atticus said professional people were poor because the farmers were poor. As Maycomb County was farm country, nickels and dimes were hard to come by for doctors and dentists and lawyers. Entailment was only one part of Mr. Cunningham's vexations or problems. 
The acres not entailed were mortgaged to the hilt, and the little cash he made went to interest. If he held his mouth right, Mr. Cunningham could get a WPA job, but his land would go to ruin if he left it, and he was willing to go hungry to keep his land and vote as he pleased. Mr. Cunningham said Atticus came from one set breed of men. So the Cunninghams were in a lot of debt because of the, the farm and the crash of the stock market and, and so on. As the Cunninghams had no money to pay for a lawyer, they simply paid us with what they had. Did you know, said Atticus, that Dr. Reynolds works the same way? He charges some folks a bushel of potatoes for the delivery of a baby. Miss Scout, if you give me your attention, I'll tell you what entailment is. Jim's definitions are very nearly accurate sometimes. If I could have explained these things to Miss Caroline, I would have saved myself some inconvenience and Miss Caroline some sequent mortification or embarrassment. But it was beyond my ability to explain things as well as Atticus. So I said, you're shaming him, Miss Caroline. Walter hasn't got a quarter at home to bring you, and you can't use any stove wood. Miss Caroline stood stock still, then grabbed me by my collar, hauled me back to her desk. Jean Louise, I've had about, about enough of you this morning, she said. You're starting off on the wrong foot in every way, my dear. Hold out your hand. I thought she was going to spit on it which is the only way, reason anybody in Macomb held out his hand. It was a time-honored method of sealing oral contracts. Wondering what bargain we made, I turned to the class for an answer, but the class looked back at me in puzzlement. Miss Caroline picked up her ruler and gave me half a dozen quick little pats and then told me to stand in the corner. A storm of laughter broke out loose when it finally occurred to me Heard to the class that Miss Caroline had whipped me. When Miss Caroline threatened it with a similar fate, the first grade exploded in laughter again, becoming cold sober only when the shadow of Miss Blount fell over them. Miss Blount, a native Macomian, as yet initiated in the mysteries of the decimal system, appeared in the door, hands on hips, and announced, If I hear another sound out of this room, I'll burn up everybody in it. Miss Caroline, the sixth grade, cannot concentrate on the pyramids for all this racket. My sojourn to the corner was a short one, saved by the bell. Miss Caroline watched the class file out for lunch, and I was last to leave. I saw her sink down into her chair and bury her head into her arms. Had her conduct been more friendly towards me, I would have felt sorry for her. She was a pretty little thing. Okay, so... Um, we'll discuss uh, some of these misunderstandings here in just a little bit.